This is Senate Government Operations. It is um, Tuesday, March 23rd. And <clears throat> excuse me for my, I'm not sure what's going on here, but anyway. Um, and so we're going to, today we're going to look at a couple different things. Um, the Under the proposal for the, to create the Agency of Public Safety from a department, the reorganization is one of the issues is putting the academy under in in the department. And um, so we've had, we would like to have some discussion on how, how to maintain the independence of the council. So we've asked um, a couple different people to come and talk to us about that. Um, Bill Sorrell, Bill Sheets, um, um, Pete Lynch is the, hi Pete, um, is the, um, the head of the fire academy. And um, Michael DeRoches is um, resp uh, somewhat responsible for the fire academy. I'm not exactly sure your role. And <clears throat> Chris Corbin, I'm not sure your role. Do you wanna just tell me what your role is? Yes, I'm the chairman of the Vermont Fire Service Training Council. Oh. Great. Okay, great, great. Because I, I know that that has had independence for some time and we want to hear how that works and um, how it might work with the, the council also, the Criminal Justice Council. So <laughs> with that, um, what I'd like to do is I think first hear um, a little update from um, Mr. Sorrell about where the council is right now. Just a brief overview, and then we'll get to the independence um, portion of it. Does that work? Well, you are you are muted though. And I know people have been trying to do that to you for years, but um, <laughs> success. <laughs> uh, and I think tomorrow we are presenting on issues of the work of the different, some of the S-124, uh, uh, you, you know, uh, directives to, to the council to carry out. <clears throat> right, tomorrow uh, we're gonna hear the report on uh, the use of military equipment, body cams, and the, the issue of uh, what, what kinds of things are we looking for when we're hiring uh, law enforcement, when we're looking for law enforcement people, and, and then what, uh, additional kinds of things are we looking for when we're looking for supervisory roles. So we'll hear those reports tomorrow. But this is just kind of an update and mainly to talk about the independence. Okay, uh, well, let, let me deal with the independence first. Uh, I think I, in prior testimony, expressed some of my personal opinions on the fact that under S-124, the council is essentially in charge of the training of law enforcement officers uh, and consequently with the expansion of the old training council to the now the 24 person criminal justice council and the addition of so many different uh, voices that have not traditionally been involved on in issues of police training. Uh, uh, I expressed my view that uh, the, the, my personal view that the council should be independent of an agency or some other wing in uh, state government. And that uh, in a related way that the executive director of the council Im implementing the, uh, the council's directives on training of law enforcement that the council should have the authority to appoint the executive director. Uh, so very briefly, uh, the council has been very busy. Uh, and I'm pleased to report that uh, we, you'll hear from Bill Sheets today and again tomorrow. I won't be able to be here tomorrow because I have a conflict with my second COVID uh, vaccination uh, this time tomorrow afternoon. <laughs> Uh, exciting. But uh, we <clears throat> have just at uh, recently uh, successfully completed the hunt for a permanent executive director. And uh, I think it's April 12th 
will be the official day for Heather Simons, who's in the hierarchy of the Department of Corrections and was the clear choice of the, the council and outside uh, folks whom uh, Commissioner Sherling uh, uh, brought into the process to give feedback on who should be the new executive director, governor's approval and the council has hired Heather Simons and uh, we're gonna miss Bill Sheets, he is doing and has done great public service serving us in an interim uh, capacity, uh, but we're looking forward to come April, uh, Heather being, uh, being on board. Uh, so at the February monthly meeting of the council, under S-124, the council was to consult with others and take a position, a council position on whether it should be independent of an agency of public safety or uh, some other entity in, in state government. And so we put that to the council uh, at our February uh, meeting. And in the invitation to testify today, there was a question as to whether uh, some other council members other than just hearing from me, uh, you know, could be arranged. And I thought the most expeditious way to do that was to just very briefly read from the area, the section of the approved minutes of that February meeting on this issue of uh, the independence of the council and the hiring of uh, the executive director. And uh, Chief Burkell, who's the representative of the Chiefs Association, uh, Chris Burkell from Brandon. Uh, once the question was put to the council for discussion, he said that the council should be autonomous. Uh, sheriff Mark Anderson, representing the sheriffs, uh, said that the council should be memorialized in statute and retain authority. Trevor Whipple, who represents uh, under S-124, the Vermont League of Cities and Towns, and happens to have been the former police chief of, uh, of South Burlington, uh, he, when he remarked, said that the philosophy of the League of Cities and Towns and his own personal opinion is that the council should be working on training models up to and including the hiring of the executive director who will implement those policies as designed. Uh, Council member Karen Tronsgaard Scott from, she's the executive director of the Network Against uh, Domestic and Sexual Violence. She said uh, that she believes that independence of the council is necessary. Uh, just a couple more. Uh, Council member Kareem Chapman, who is a gubernatorial appointee uh, a representative of individuals who have expressed mental health challenges in their life. And uh, Graham Chapman is with the uh, Psychiatric Survivors Organization out of Rutland, very active member of the, the council, contributing member. And he said, uh, quote, it is really refreshing to hear the overwhelming support in diversity and voices the bigger picture is the community needs to know that it's not just law enforcement, but others have a voice in the picture. Uh, uh, Brian Searles, another gubernatorial appointee. Uh, interestingly, another former uh, South Burlington police chief among other jobs in state government and out of state government. Uh, he said, uh, the person uh, uh, in the executive director chair is representative of all law enforcement in the state. It's important when speaking to the legislature to be viewed as independent and not controlled by any one department or agency. And finally, uh, uh, Chief Burkell uh, said that the council being autonomous and appointing the executive director is a healthier choice and model. And it's noted in our minutes, which we have filed with the committee for uh, this morning so that you have them in your records of this hearing. Uh, uh, no member of the council voiced 
sentiments in favor of a reduced independence of the council. So uh, uh, I've quoted from those who spoke to the issue, but no one when given an opportunity to speak otherwise uh, from law enforcement or from outside law enforcement uh, uh, thought that the council should be other than independent and no one thought that uh, the council shouldn't retain the authority to appoint the executive director and the other uh, uh, chief positions at the at the council, or excuse me, at the academy. And uh, interestingly, I mentioned that Heather Simons uh, uh, will be the the new exec permanent executive director come April, but uh, the council, since it got up and running at the end of December. Uh, has uh, filled the director position for administrative uh, uh, services, uh, you know, all sort of the logistical stuff at the council, uh, a woman named Lindsay Tivierge. And so uh, I said at the council meeting last, uh, last week, our, our March meeting, I am quite confident that there is no police academy in this country that has its three top position all female uh, and not just female. Uh, we are fortunate, I think we've got three very, very competent uh, uh, officials. The, the hierarchy of the police academy uh, is in good hands and uh, I'm delighted that the council has accomplished the things that it's accomplished uh, uh, so far. And you'll hear more about what the council's doing uh, the real work of the council is in the, the subcommittees and the so-called working groups, uh, many of which we've created just in the last uh, two and a half months. And you'll hear, uh, you'll hear more on that uh, tomorrow. So I hope, uh, Madam Chair, that I've articulated the feelings of the council on the independence issue. Uh, as it relates to the, uh, an agency of public safety or any other potential entity in state government that the council might be legislatively put under, uh, uh, you know, answer to. So the, um, I think that, uh, committee, do, does anybody have any questions first? Um, right now, okay. So I, the, the, as I see it here, the conundrum is that the academy is slated to be put under the under DPS or APS, where whatever you want to call it, but that the council will remain independent, and that we, that that's where we need to um, make sure that we. Um, did Did you want to say something, Bill? Yeah, yes, uh, Senator. I, I, I think in earlier testimony, both uh, Bill Sheets and I talked about putting the academy, not the curriculum and the training, but sort of the nuts and bolts of the academy under either an agency of public safety or some other like entity uh, under state government for budgeting purposes, contracting purposes, uh, applying for and managing grants, I think that uh, that has merit. Uh, it's a bit of a fine line because the council is gonna be the boss of the, all of the training, but we've got such a small staff that those kinds of IT issues uh, and the like being in an agency structure that has its own IT division or unit or whatever, those kinds of things are of value. And just uh, another important thing on the, on the issue of the council, it, and it really has been playing out this, in this legislative session, is that even though uh, Commissioner Sherling has stated publicly that He's of the view that the, the finance and the funding of the academy is severely underfunded. Uh, and I, I don't want to, my recollection is he said upwards of a million and a half dollars underfunded, but 
don't hold me to that. I'm pretty sure that's what he said, but it's very significant underfunding. And unfortunately, uh, in the governor's recommend, we had a minor, we were in for a minor increase uh, that was more cost of living uh, uh, issues. And we, that is the council, uh, have appeared before the House GovOps, uh, House Appropriations multiple times, and we have not yet testified before Senate Appropriations, but we're very pleased and relieved that, as Executive Director Sheets will talk about more either today or tomorrow, that there's a recommendation for two very critical new positions for the operations of the council, particularly the area of professional regulation of law enforcement, allegedly uh, guilty or having committed unprofessional acts. And it's for an investigative position, an independent investigator and uh, legal counsel. And uh, so, uh, we haven't had the opportunity to appear uh, before Senator Kitchell's committee, but we look forward to that. And we have not been afraid to be respectfully critical of the administration's recommendation of the budgeting for the functioning of the academy. And I think going forward, whatever you do on whether you put the academy under the Agency of Public Safety or some other entity, the fact that the council should be allowed to be an independent voice for the financial needs of the operation of the uh, training of police uh, would be very important. And we hope that if you, your committee is in agreement that whether it's in a formal way or in cafeteria talk that uh, if you think these positions and maybe some one-time uh, money for some staffing needs that uh, Bill Sheets is prepared to talk about <laughs> are important to really be able to start to really do the kinds of things you have instructed the council to do under S-124, uh, we hope that you will speak supportively to Senator Kitchell's committee uh, giving due regard to the council's needs. And we'd appreciate your help in that respect. Thank you. I think that um, <clears throat> this is a big priority for us. So I, it probably, we probably will speak favorably. We'd much appreciate it, Senator. Yeah. So yeah. Senator Clarkson. Yes, your, your Senate Government Operations Committee are strong advocates uh, for, for, for this Ma bill. Ma and, sure you, and I have we to lost say, that our, whole our thing. chair has- Wait. Excuse me, uh, Senator Collimore? Yeah, we lost your whole uh, statement there, Madam Chair. You kind of froze up for about a minute. Oh, I, oh, I do. Oh, thank you. All I, said, all I said was that um, we're strong proponents of the of the Academy and of the Council and will probably speak favorably to the Appropriations Committee. Sorry about that. Right. Senator Cullimore, I just saw you freeze after you, so okay. it, might, it might be you. I guess we're all freezing. <laughs> I know, on this warm, sunny spring day. So Senator Clarkson, what were you now, saying? I was just wanted to finish by saying that not only are we strong advocates of this bill, uh, and of the changes uh, it, with the council. And, and uh, I, I have to say our chair has an incredible record in approves. So I think that you do want uh, the Senate Government Operations Committee to be your advocates for these, for anything you want to ask for in approves. <laughs> well, it, 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 it's a little bit um, weirder to do it this way, but at least when you go into the approve committee now you're not sitting in these little chairs <clears throat> like a supplement <laughs> supplement, supplement. <laughs> so so what i'd like to do is <clears throat> right now uh take advantage of the three people from the fire academy who are here who have joined us and <clears throat> talk a little bit about 
the fire academy is under DPS right now, as I understand, but that the council is independent, has autonomy and is independent. Is, am I right about that? And I guess, um, <clears throat> how do you want to approach this? Um, how, the three of you, how do you? So, um, yes, Mike. Yeah, Madam Chair, thank you for um, extending the invitation to be here today and, and thank you to the committee. Uh, I think what I will do is give kind of a, uh, just a little bit of a landscape here that may help frame some conversation. Uh, the Fire Service Training Council is housed in fire, uh, in the Department of Public Safety now under 20 VSA chapter 179. So it is not, um, by virtue, an independent council such as the Vermont Criminal Justice Council. Framework-wise, there is a lot of distinct difference between the powers and duties of the Fire Service Training Council and that of the Vermont Criminal uh, Justice Council. So there, there are two distinct councils with responsibilities, but the Fire <laughs> Service Training Council is housed in fire safety. The Fire Academy is housed uh, in the Department of Public Safety under the Division of Fire Safety. So that's kind of the landscape. There really, there really is no, um, they're housed there now. And, and to speak to a little bit of what Bill Sorrell was uh, alluding to, th there are some advantages that we see on the fire service side of it being housed in public safety. And, and to speak to IT support budgeting, uh, the Division of Fire Safety pays for promulgating the rules and going through the rulemaking process. And we're also 100% um, embedded uh, with the fire service. And uh, Pete and Chris Corbin, they can speak to the, the details of the, the, the council's responsibilities as they go. But I will just add that um, this council has been um, extremely effective the relationship that the Division of Fire Safety and Public Safety has with the Fire Service Training Council is probably the best uh, that it's been in years. Um, so we are, we are from speaking from my position, very happy with where the Fire Service Training Council sits. We're very pleased with the work of the council. Um, the council is responsible for uh, the training aspects. We don't discipline firefighters. Um, you know, so there is a lot of difference between uh, the councils that I just wanted to emphasize uh, to you. The, um, our training council is made up of 12 members. Basically all the fire service groups are represented. Are represented. We have the commissioner of labor Commissioner of Health, Commissioner of Public Safety, myself. Um, and anyways, under the under 20 VSA, uh, we have a 12 member group. Um, so that's kind of a quick rundown. And also to um, touch base a little bit, I also chair the, um, the uh, governance committee down there at the facility. So we have a legislative governance committee that oversees some areas, access and use contracts, um, capital construction bills. Um, so there's a great relationship that exists down there right now between all the users of that training facility. So I just wanna emphasize that. So in testimony at future times, if you are engaged in conversations mm -hmm. regarding the governance committee, uh, that you know that we um, have a single voice coming out of that training facility regarding those specific areas of responsibility. We do not engage in training. So the councils stay independent there on the training of their respective professions where this governance committee is there uh, on those specific areas of access, use contracts and capital construction. So that's kind of the, the landscape, but the council's in fire safety now. Thank you. Thanks. Yep. Any questions for Mike? Um, Pete, do you want to? <clears throat> and I, in full disclosure, I'll say that um, <clears throat> Pete was on the Rattleboro Fire Department, when, and um, <clears throat> I have seen him 
I'm sure you're happy now not having to deal with bed bugs every other day. <laughs> it's kind of sad that that's my reputation, right? Bed <laughs> well, you have a better reputation than that. <laughs> Everybody in Brattleboro loved you. Thank you, Madam Chair. And it's great to be with you. So I think I'd like to talk about day-to-day -day operations within the Fire Academy and allow the chair of the Fire Training Council, Chris Corbin, to talk about the council and its and the specificity it has. Um, so I suspect that most of you have uh, are pretty comfortable with the Fire Academy and, and what we do, but I'd just like to take a quick minute to talk about uh, how we fit into the Department of Public Safety and the Division of Fire Safety. So uh, thank you to Director DeRosia. Um, the Division of Fire Safety uh, is, is, are the folks that are in charge of uh, the Fire Academy. I specifically answer directly to Director DeRosia as Chief of Training for the Fire Academy. And the council doesn't um, have much to do with our day-to-day -day operations. The, the, the chair will talk about that and, and certification and, and professional qualification board fire service. We, um, in our day-to-day -day operations, we employ seven full-time um, uh, people who manage uh, training, development, and, um, and place classes around the state. As you may be aware, the, the fire service in Vermont, which is about 5,500 people, um, is 90, more than 95% volunteer. And so what, what makes us a little different from the folks at the police academy is the bulk of our programs are outreach and, and not on campus. And so um, it is important that we uh, are out in the field in the 230 communities that have fire departments to assist them with training. And because they are mostly volunteer, our training happens a lot of the time on nights and weekends. Some of our classes are as long as 200 hours long. They start the 1st of September and they complete with a certification exam in June. And so it requires us to have about 100 part-time or temporary employees in order to manage that training. And all of those employees are certified to be instructors for the academy, um, some at uh, some at levels for um, entry level firefighters, some uh, to instruct officer level training, and others um, in special rescue, and that could be a, that could be hazmat as well. So, as a fire academy. Um, we employ a great number of people temporarily. We manage a budget uh, with a special fund of about uh, $1.2 million and a general fund budget. Our special fund budget is insurance money and the general fund budget is a little bit over 400,000. And so um, we take great advantage in um, the Department of Public Safety um, both with human resources and with the accounting department um, to help manage our employees and manage our budget. And that's a, that's a huge advantage for us to have, to have a network that we can reach out to to aid us in, in managing these, these great groups. Um, we offer, uh, I said earlier, some of our classes are as long as 200 hours. We offer 13 programs, which are certification level on a national standard. And those um, programs uh, are very long in length and therefore both beginner and then officer level uh, folks. And then we offer about an additional 50 courses, which are shorter, typically under 40 hours. Um, and most of those we can do out in the field, although, for specifics like um, our live fire training, um, uh, we have to bring people to the academy in Pittsburgh on the campus that we share with, with, um, 
with Bill Sheets and his group. That's kind of an overview of, of the, the Fire Academy and our day-to-day -day operations. Um, before the chair speaks, I will tell you that um, over the last five years, we've put together about 70 standard operating guidelines to help uh, maneuver our way through, through um, our working relationships with the fire service. And about half of those are approved by the council, the training council. So um, as, as the chair speaks, um, keep in mind that uh, while we, we have a lot of um, input from the Division of Fire Safety, uh, there is a process that we go to that involves the council and those 12 members of the council all represent parties that have great interest in how um, the fire service in Vermont is uh, educated. So thank you again, Madam Chair, and I'm happy to answer questions. Thanks. Um, before I ask if anybody has questions, I will say that when you were talking about um, the live training really needs to be at the academy. And um, I've been working at a place in Brattleboro where we actually destroyed, uh, tore down, I think it's uh, 11 or 15 buildings now. And on each, each time, the fire department was given the ability to come and go through the roof and go in the buildings. And they didn't um, do fires, but they did a lot of that. And it's really, it's hard to get that kind of training because um, there isn't an opportunity a lot of times, but um, they were, it was great to see them out there poking through the roofs of the buildings. But For, for years and years, um, we learned through experience and through the great work of fire safety in Vermont, our, our fires have reduced tremendously. And so those men and women coming through the door now don't have the opportunity to gain the experience quickly by going to fire after fire after fire. And that's what makes the training so critical, critical to the safety of, of the people that we represent throughout the state, critical to the the safety of the firefighters that are that are doing their jobs, and also uh, from a monetary perspective, uh, the more knowledgeable and capable we are, the the more we minimize the fire loss in the state, and that's that's huge in terms of recovery for businesses and homeowners. Yeah. Thanks. Any questions for Pete, and then we'll jump to Chris. Okay. Chris, thank you. Good afternoon. Thank you all for uh, the invitation. As, uh, as the director said, the council is made up of 12 individuals, six of which are uh, appointed by the governor. Uh, just for clarification, I am the chair. I represent the professional firefighters of Vermont. I'm a career fire captain in the city of South Burlington. And I guess I'll just cover both of what the director and the, and the chief of training said in a little bit more detail. Our purview of the council is certification of firefighters and fire officers and fire instructors. However, we do not actually do the certification. The fire academy conducts the testing and uh, handles all the certification process. We simply ensure... Uh, two things. One, that the certification meets the National uh, Fire Protection Association standards and that the testing certification meet uh, pro board requirements. And the pro board is a nationally recognized organization uh, in which the state of Vermont has chosen to certify their firefighters uh, at all levels through pro board. Uh, so if the fire academy, go back to the, what the chief said, day-to-day -day operations. If the fire academy is choosing how they're going to test students, how they're going to evaluate students, uh, if they're gonna change curriculum uh, that is based on a program that is a certification program, that all gets run through the council. Uh, anyone who challenges uh, a certification, be it their certification expired or they're trying to challenge the process from an outside agency and they don't, 
for lack of a better term, they want to grieve the situation that they feel to meet, they meet the requirements and the chief of training says they don't, uh, then those cases would come before the council for us to deal with uh, and determine per the rules uh, and policies of the council whether they should be certified, should maintain their certification, so on and so forth. Uh, we do, we have zero, uh, we have zero formal uh, contact with the day-to-day -day operations. However, Chief Lynch has been excellent through his designing of the SOGs and moving the organization forward. Uh, as he said, about half those SOGs that they operate under are approved by us the council because they affect certification and coursework the other half i'd say of that uh half of those are still brought to our attention and asked to be endorsed where they may not actually fall under our purview but they impact the all the constituents that the council represents so he asked he brings those forward for our endorsement and our support and then there are another quarter of those that just completely do not involve us whatsoever. Uh, and then he provides those to us for information only. Uh, we have no financial uh, backing. We have no financial pot of money. So as the director said, uh, last year uh, in February, we finally put forth uh, and had new rules and policies updated uh, through the legislature that the cost of that and frankly, the, uh, the, man hours of putting the process through the different aspects of state government, the division of fire supported us on and uh, helped me move that process along. So we certainly, as far as that's concerned, we would be in our current state lost if we didn't have the division with us. Uh, they definitely provide that support for us, which is important. Uh, just looking at my notes here, just, uh, I think another thing just to, and I kind of hit, hit on this, but to recognize is the little bit I do know about the Criminal Justice Training Council, they have a much larger scope uh, of work. They have a much larger workload uh, than we do as the Fire Service Training Council. And I think a lot of that has to do with the Fire Academy is covering a lot of the stuff that normally, and the Division of Fire, that normally, you know, the Criminal Justice Training Council on the police side of things would handle. Uh, we, uh, per statute, we're supposed to meet twice a year. We usually meet three to four times a year. Uh, and just to give you a quick overview, uh, the professional firefighters of Vermont have a seat at the table, the Vermont career chiefs, the Vermont fire chiefs, which are the volunteer fire, fire chiefs in the state, the, uh, the VSFA, which is the association that represents the Vermont or the uh, volunteer fire service. Uh, a member of the public, and who am I missing? Uh, oh, and the insurance uh, representative from the insurance companies. Uh, they they hold the seat at the table, and as the chief had mentioned earlier, that's pretty that's a pretty big deal because we get a lot of our budget from the insurance uh, companies for the training. Uh, for the academy and so they have a seat at the table as well uh with the uh with the training council i'm happy to ask, answer any questions uh like i said i think that we are definitely a much simpler organization uh we certainly do as the director said we do fall under uh public safety in the statutes but we definitely work hand in hand uh with the division and with the fire academy and I don't see, no matter where we're put in the system, the way we would operate and unless statute changed as to what our governance was, we would still fill the same gap, uh, provide the same mission and work with the same partners either way. Thank you. I think that, <clears throat> I don't think that we have any intention of changing any statutes around the fire academy or the council, but just wanted to get a sense of how they how it compared with the the uh, criminal justice council in the academy. So, Senator Collimore. Thank you, Madam Chair, and thank you uh, to all of you for showing up today and giving us your testimony for sure. 
Chris, you mentioned something about grieving certification, and I'm just, um, it just struck me as, huh, okay. So somebody gets into the uh, fire academy, they get trained, and at some point, are they on a path for a professional job, and that's why they need certification? Can you just explain what, what the certification uh, process looks like and how somebody can grieve it if they've gone through the academy and got trained? I, I'm, I'm not clear on that. Sure. So uh, if we take two paths, whether we look at the volunteer service or the career fire service, so in state statute, a full-time firefighter defined as uh, working more than 32 hours a week or more than 25 weeks a year uh, has to maintain a minimum certification standard. The volunteer fire service, it's departmental, it's a department organization's decision as to what certifications they are or are not going to make their members uh, achieve and maintain. So the academy certifies and recertifies the, that, that firefighter career or volunteer through a process. Um, I can give you two examples of situations we normally deal with. One on the career side would be someone either coming in from another state. Uh, the academy has pretty strict and obvious a strict and obvious path as to how you're going to come from outside of Vermont and maintain or establish a certification here. On a side note, I, uh, interestingly enough, uh, Vermont is probably one of the most strict states in the entire country for achieving and maintaining firefighter certifications. Uh, so a lot of times what happens is we see people from other areas of the country come here want to maintain their certification and they don't meet the requirements laid out. Uh, so they would put in their paperwork for reciprocity. It would be denied by the academy. They would, put a, they would put a formal letter into the chief of training saying, hey, I want to grieve this. Here are all the reasons. Uh, and typically because it's certification, the chief of training just automatically passes that on to the council. Uh, and there, it happens very infrequently. The few times it has happened uh, on that aspect, it's usually pretty cut and dry as to whether it falls within the rules that we've approved or not. And it, it ends at that level. Uh, so basically it's someone's end course or end stop in the process to try to gain a certification that they're, they're saying for their own personal reasons they deserve, even though it doesn't meet the state uh, rules. From the volunteer side, uh, we see the struggles of uh, volunteers holding careers, second jobs, third jobs, families, all that. Uh, and occasionally we'll deal with a volunteer member who has just, you know, because of the course of life the, or whatever the case may be, hasn't been able to maintain their certifications. Uh, so they'll, they'll come to the academy again and say, hey, you know, this happened in my life and I was unable to maintain my certification. I want an extension. Again, the, the academy follows their course of action and the rules that we've laid out and says, no, I'm sorry, you don't meet the requirements. You can grieve it to the council if you so choose. And then uh, I would say the majority of the time, that's where it ends. Uh, but we have seen on rare occasion that that volunteer member will come before the council and uh, say, here's my heartache, here's my heartache, here's what happened in my life and why I wasn't able to recertify in time. And here's my proposal as to why I think and how I should get an extension. Great explanation. Thank you very much, Chris. Any other questions right now? Uh, Senator Polina. Thanks. I'm just trying to get a handle on the relationship. You say you're under DPS, DPS, right? And I'm just wondering, like, could you give me an example or two of like times when you might say, well, we have to make this kind of decision, but we have to go to DPS to see if it's okay. And is there, does that ever come up? I mean, because we're talking about level of independence. And so it's a question for any of you. I just wonder if there's an example of something where you would have to go to DPS to get permission for lack of a better way of putting it to do something or not. I'll, I'll say, I'll start out from the council level. No, uh, the one thing that I will say, uh, I'll just go back to the example I used earlier where when we had to, uh, when it came time to 
produce new rules and policies of the council and put that through uh, the ICAR process and the legislative process. Obviously, there's a financial aspect to that. There's also just a labor intensive procedure process to that, sure. where the division of fire, uh, you know, Director DeRosia provided the funding out of his budget to uh, go through the process and also provided uh, at the time the deputy director as uh, I'll call my my wing person. Uh, he did a lot of the he did a lot of the legwork, a lot of the groundwork, a lot of the day to day policies and procedures that he knew because he worked in state government day in and day out and did it with multiple other rules and policies throughout state government. Uh, so that's that's really the only aspect I, I would speak to from the council level that we uh, we need DPS for, you know, the Division of Fire. Uh, but I will say that there's a very good working relationship where I think the fire service, not just the council, but, you know, the council is representative of the entire fire service in the state and the council or the fire service through the council benefits greatly from that connection with the Division of Fire, AKA the DPS. So I saw that um, before we go to Senator Clarkson, I saw that Pete, you had your hand up also, I think to respond to that question. Thank you. Uh, Senator, was your, was your question specific to the council or was it uh, the fire academy in general? In general. Well, the council most importantly, perhaps, but in general. So, so from a fire academy standpoint, um, in terms of answering to uh, Director DeRosia and the Division of Fire Safety on budgetary issues, uh, we answer to him. On personnel issues, we answer to him. Anything contractual, uh, we answer uh, directly to um, the Division of Fire Safety within the Department of Public Safety. He's a tough boss, right? He's, he's tremendously uh, supportive of us and the council. And um, well, nobody has said it to this point. Uh, he does attend all the training council meetings and he is, he is uh, through statute, uh, one of the 12 members of that council. So he is, he remains fully aware of what's going on uh, throughout our, our section of the, of the division. Thanks, thanks. Senator Clarkson, did you have a question? Well, and I just would add, and at this time of year, he's fully aware, aware of everything we're doing too. <laughs> Mike and I are intimately involved on another bill. Um, I would like to uh, just ask uh, two questions. First of all, I'd just like to note that I think the Fire uh, Academy and Council really are a unique in many ways in state government because they are one of the few places we see volunteers and professionals working side by side, doing the same job in a way, doing the same job. And, and it, it's very unusual blending of those two and training them to same standards and some are professional and some are not. And uh, I think that's an interesting, uh, really as, as we oversee these things, you're, you're really unique in that regard. I suppose EMT has some of that, but you even more than others. Anyway, my questions are twofold. Would you be kind enough? I have a son who's a, a volunteer firefighter here in Woodstock. And um, I'm just curious what the balance is between volunteers and professionals, how many of each? And then my second question is, uh, what do we do about bad apples in the fire service? Uh, are, is our departments responsible for getting rid of them? Or is there, I mean, to just to go to build on Brian's point about grievance, is there a disciplinary function that is state, a state version of a disciplinary function or is it just department to department? Yes, Pete. Thank you, Senator. So uh, your question about um, volunteerism, um, there are 5,500 firefighters throughout the state of Vermont and over 95% of those are volunteer. Now, yeah. in some cases, those, those men and women are paid uh, in different ways. Some are paid by the calls they get on 
they, that, they, that they respond to. Some are paid a small stipend, stipend right. yearly, but by and large, the group is volunteer. We're starting to see in the fire service more and more um, chief positions on fire departments being made career instead of volunteer because of the enormous amount of time that it takes to lead a department. Um, so that those numbers are increasing, but um, uh, the career service is not, uh, I, I don't think it's growing exponentially. I don't, you know, I, I don't think over the next five years, we're gonna see 50% change or anything like that. Um, and in terms of um, who is responsible for uh, disciplining the, the firefighters around the state, that's specifically uh, to a department or to a municipality. Um, we do now have the right to uh, deny somebody certification uh, based on um, their criminal record or, or some sort of wrongdoing. At any time during a training process, if we feel as though a student is not, um, um, does not meet the uh, requirements of, uh, of uh, the state of Vermont in terms of um, uh, their legal being, their, uh, uh, you know, if they've broken the law, uh, or if in the class they do something that is inappropriate. And most of the time, because the people that are signing up for our programs that are 200 hours long are very dedicated, we do not run into situations where people are um, are not fully vested in the system and, and are, are doing something that's inappropriate. But in those occasions, we have the, the right to remove them from class. And um, oftentimes we will have the conversation with their fire chief prior to removing them from the class. And, um, and those relationships um, typically are very good in the way that the, the chief understands our perspective and generally supports it. But those are very, very few um, as a result of, you know, if, if somebody's gonna uh, take the time from their family and their part-time job or their full-time job to spend 200 hours becoming a, a firefighter one or a firefighter two or an officer, they, their commitment is typically, um, is, is typically good uh, with great intent of, of doing good for their community. And we don't, as a rule, don't run into many of those situations anymore. Thank you. Thanks, any more questions? So this was, this was very helpful to us. We were hoping that you would have some um, magic uh, statutory language that would assure the, um, the independence of the Criminal Justice Council, but given that you didn't come in with magic language. Um, we still are very happy that you um, gave us this lesson on the Academy and the Council in the Fire Safety Division. Um, any other questions or comments committee? Senator Polina? I just really got to say how much I appreciate firefighters in general. I mean, you know, buildings on fire, everybody's running out and the firefighters are running in. I mean, it's just, it's just amazing to me that people are willing to do that, quite honestly. I really, really appreciate it. You know, it is interesting that we're responsible to train <clears throat> those individuals that want to run to this versus, versus running away. So, it, you know, it challenges us from a training perspective, too. Uh, you know, just the audience that we're, we're training and to touch just one brief second on the volunteer and career partnership. We also have a fire service coalition with representation from every fire service entity group. That coalition uh, is very uh, uh, efficient and effective. Uh, the group is uh, gets along real good, works really nice. The other part is I, we, in fire safety, we have uh, urban search and rescue. And we also have the state hazmat response team. Both those teams comprise of uh, uh, both career firefighters and volunteers. They all get paid the same when they're out on call. So the hat's off at the door. 
has been extremely successful. Um, and it just builds a lot of great partnerships between those two entities out there on our special team. So I would just add that. Yeah, that's good. Thank you. Senator Clarkson. Yeah, sorry. One, one further thought. I mean, I just, who, I know you have a challenge recruiting new firefighters, volunteer firefighters in particular. Uh, and so I'm just curious, who's responsible for sort of marketing that? And is there a campaign designed to do that? And the reason I ask is, um, I'm also curious about who, who, you know, is that a division? Uh, because we have all this ARPA money coming and I'm just curious if, if there's a way that that can be used to both educate the public and about further about fires and or recruit more. Um, and the educating about fires I've been made well aware of, um, sadly with the death of a student in uh, Portland, Oregon. And they, the Portland Fire Department created a terrific video educating particularly university and college students who are in housing, not always perfect, and about fires, you know, who, who didn't, hadn't necessarily grown up there. I'm just curious, you know, if, if you do the same kind of thing and, and how, is that something that's on your radar screen for, um, for the best answer, money? Right. The best answer I'm gonna give you is that it's on our radar. Um, has been for a number of years, and I think you'll you'll see the same struggle in law enforcement regarding uh, recruitment and retention. And uh, you know, th there's fewer people to select from today too. There's fewer students that are coming out of high school. Um, you, there's a lot of things that are against us when it comes to seeking volunteers to give up time with no pay. Um, to devote all these hours. And you know, another challenge is the fire service has really evolved over the past 10, 15 years. You know, there's a lot more operational involvement that the fire service uh, engages in now compared to 15, 20 years ago. Car accidents are different. EMS strategies are a lot different. Structure fires are a lot different. They burn a lot hotter, a lot faster. The, the, the challenges that are out there are really stacked up against the recruitment. We have had a number of meetings with the Washington delegation. Um, Haley Peril from Senator Sanders' office has been a big supporter and ally uh, with us. She's attended a number of meetings with us and offered some social media uh, resources to help come out with a video on uh, recruitment and retention. But, you know, it's across all disciplines, nursing, it's law enforcement, fire, but it's absolutely on our radar and a concern of where, you know, what's the fire service going to look like in five years? Yeah, no, big oh. question. Yeah. I'll, Mike, I'll send you this video that was sent to me so you Thank can you. See, see what Portland did. So I think that, um, as Mike pointed out, it's across all professions. And one of the issues that in addition to not being um, enough people and enough trained people, I think one of the issues is that um, we're seeing um, an increase in the number of people who want to have regular nine to five jobs. They don't want to be called out in the middle of the night. And we're seeing that with um, uh, our road plowers. Um, we're seeing it with law enforcement. We're seeing it with um, professional medical people. Um, a friend of mine was an OBGYN and they couldn't recruit somebody to their office because she wanted a regular job and not to be called out in the middle of the night if somebody was giving birth. So I think that there's, um, it, it's, um, I, I don't know how we change that, that um, mindset, but that is a huge issue in terms of recruiting people who need to be able to respond when there is the emergency or the event. So any other questions or comments or concerns right now? So what I'm gonna suggest, um, thank you very much, um, Pete and Chris and Mike, very helpful, thank you. What I'm going to suggest to Bill is that, um, or Bill and Bill, as um, I know that Mark said that it needed to be enshrined in statute, the 
how to maintain that independence of the council. And I, I would suggest that um, before our next meeting on this, that if you can work with, um, I don't know if it would be Tucker or Ameren <clears throat> to come up with some kind of language around what, what kind of language do we need to put into statute to assure the independence of the council? Is that a challenge that you'll accept? Absolutely. We appreciate okay. the opportunity. We have interacted with Ameren some. I think we've shared some language, but we'll get on that again. Yeah, I, I think that, um, and I'd like to uh, take this up again next week. So if you can, um, toward the end of the week. So if you could have some kind of language and, and um, <clears throat> I, I don't know who else it would be run by, but just to see if we can really strengthen the statutes around the independence. Uh, will do, thank you. Any other questions from committee members or comments? Does that make sense to do that? Yes. Okay, and Senator Clarkson, I believe you are leaving. Oh, happily, it got changed. Oh, oh right, okay, okay, sorry, sorry, so, okay. But I, uh, thank you again to the firefighters, I'd echo Anthony's comment we we uh we are in your in your debt and Always. i appreciate it more fully being a mother of a firefighter <laughs> senator rom did you have a question well um when our bills come back with um more language on the independence of the criminal justice council i was wondering as a new senator if there's language somewhere about greater oversight and professional uh regulation investigation into misconduct that's embedded in your current framework in the CJC or if it lives in statute, I don't have that um, information. And I, I would like to see how you plan to do that and how you plan to make sure that it's a mix of former law enforcement and civilian um, oversight in that process. Okay. Yes. Does that language exist somewhere and I've just missed it? I, yeah. I believe that, <clears throat> that um, well, I'm not sure if I'm answering it right here, but I think in there was a lot of uh, language in 124 that um, directed the disciplinary procedures. And then I think the council itself has additional language. That, that's correct, Senator. Uh, specific uh, reference to the ability of the council to uh, uh, create subcommittees, but specific mention about the professional regulation subcommittee. We felt that that was particularly important to have in statute because there are due process issues at play and uh, felt would feel better if, uh, if, that, if that was clarified in statute. Uh, we have the authority, but creating the subcommittee to handle it which is our busiest subcommittee, as you'll hear tomorrow from Bill Sheets. Uh, uh, so we we'll get to that language. I think you might have it, but we'll we'll make sure you have it again. Thank you. And just so the rest of the committee knows, to be transparent. I asked Bill Sheets in an email to help us better understand the demographic makeup of the Criminal Justice Council currently. So instead of guessing he's going to ask the rest of the committee members how they identify on various demographic indicators to better understand the diversity of the Criminal Justice Council currently. Okay, any other questions, comments? Thank you so much. And we will, um, I'm hoping maybe next Thursday, but I am still <laughs> trying to figure out next week's schedule. So. Um, we'll go there. And I, again, I thank the um, <clears throat> fire safety members who are here to speak mm -hmm. to us. Thank that you. was that was very helpful. Thank you. And thank you for your service. We do appreciate it. Thank you all very much. All right. Thanks. Bye.